since the beginning of photography, it hasn't really changed all that much. You still have three primary things. Your ISO, your shutter speed, and your aperture. It's been like that ever since the old school film days, way back 100 years ago with the giant plates and stuff. Uh, and it's been like that all the way until now with the brand new fancy digital cameras. In this video, we're using the Nikon D750. It was provided by Mastrop. Mastrop has a really cool new photography community. And I was like, hey, we're getting ready to make some photography tutorials. So they were like, dude, let's work together. So thanks very much for them uh, to them for providing the camera. Go check out their uh, photography community. Now let's learn something. There's things you know, there's things you don't know, and then there's things you don't know you don't know. So let's get you guys to the I know this category. Now this is gonna be a very basic video just covering those three things. Uh, we're gonna talk to you guys maybe like you're five or you don't know anything about photography. So if you're someone who's really nerdy and wants like some science and math and all that sort of thing, wait for one of our future videos where we really get extremely nerdy about very minute details and that sort of thing. Okay, first off, ISO. That's sort of the base platform that we need to start talking about. ISO is essentially a camera's sensitivity to light or the film sensitivity to light, the uh, sensor's sensitivity to light. That's what it is. It's a measure of that. So usually you set that first, depending upon your situation. Is it a dark room? Are you outdoors in bright light? You set that first and then you can set your shutter and aperture. So first off, let's go and just take a look at what some pictures look like in sort of a dark outdoor environment at a very low ISO. And then we're going to bump the ISO up without changing any other settings and show you what it looks like. So there it is at about 100 ISO um, and you can see we're out, outdoors, kind of dark and just we're going to keep adding. Now for the record when we took these shots this was about six o'clock at night all of the light in this environment was artificial. As you can see here as we get higher it also starts to wash out just a slight bit and we'll talk about that in just a second. But there we go it's just making everything brighter. No other settings are changing. All right, you guys ready to see uh, just what the different noise levels look like? And this is with the Nikon. This, this camera is kind of the God camera. It's one of the best cameras on the market for low light photography and videography. It's kind of ridiculous. And I don't expect just about, I don't, I don't expect many other cameras to be able to compete um, as far as the low light performance goes and the just the nice noise that it produces, even at the higher ISO ratings. But let's go ahead and take a look. Go ahead and zoom in here and look around. Nice smooth grain, or I guess I call it grain because it looks almost like film, but that's noise. And then as you move up, a little bit more, you know, a little bit more noise over here. It's always good to look in the blurry areas to see because you can see the noise patterns. Moving right on up, 1600. Getting a little noisy, but this is unbelievably usable. Most cameras cannot touch this. Most cameras are going to be really, really grainy. Now for the, again, for the record, this was with a static light. It wasn't uh, wasn't the most well lit. We wanted it a little dark so we could accentuate the noise in this area. You can see it pretty, th this is a getting to a point where I would say this is still acceptable use, uh, but ultimately when you blow this up to, if you wanted this on a print that was really big, you'd see that and that would be, that would be bad. Unless you're going for the gritty look, you know, like. Unless, yeah, unless you're going and for gritty. the gritty, gritty, grungy look, yeah. Now, as far as best practices for ISO go, what you want to do is keep the ISO as low as possible and then use your shutter and aperture to give you a good exposure. Keeping the ISO low will give you nice smooth rich colors and low noise. Okay next up is now this is where it gets kind of interesting because we talk about sensitivity on the ISO but when you get into your aperture which is the the measurement of how open or closed the iris in the lens is and it allows more or less light to come through but it also does a very important thing is it controls your depth of field whether you have a really shallow depth of field and I'm not even kidding where there's some lenses where you get a depth of field that's an inch all the way to an infinity where it's wide open you can see everything in the foreground and the background and it's all very clear. Most of your telephones out there that have a camera on it, you will get a very wide depth of field, meaning it's it's deep. You can see everything in the foreground, everything in the background is also very in, in focus. And you can get varying levels of that, because sometimes you want the background to exist, but not be so far gone that it's somewhere else. So let's talk about how to control this, shall we? Yeah. Now, um, your aperture is controlled by an f-stop number. Now, the f-stop numbers, that's, it's, there's a little bit of math right here, and I'm not gonna go too crazy with it, but it's a measurement of the distance of the opening of the aperture to the edge of the inner edge of the diameter of the lens. So lower, the lower the number, the more open it is. And the more open it is, 
the more shallow the depth of field. So like an f 1.5 or 1.0 or even zero would be all the way open, but that, no lenses do that. But like an f1 or an f1.5 would be pretty open. And then as you go to higher numbers, the distance from the diameter, the edge of the, you know, the diameter of the uh, edge of the lens or the outside of the lens increases. So it goes all the way down to like 20, 22, even the 32 on some very expensive lenses. It just looks like someone just snapped this picture with a point and shoot or whatever. You got these guys over here in the background and he's getting a, something, oh, and he's getting a rifle out of his pocket. And then Seattle, no one's doing anything. Just everything's in focus, but check this out. We can lower the f-stop, increase our, or make the depth of field very shallow. And look at that. Those guys aren't even there anymore. They're, trust me, that they were there. They're hanging out over here. They're coming up the road. Just a nice smooth, look at that background. It's amazing. And this is what we're talking about when you say you want to isolate your subject, if that's what you're going for. So in cases like this one here, the subject is isolated, the background is, is well out of focus, and it's got a nice colorful, it, it creates a backdrop. Uh, there's a backlighting to, uh, to the subject, We've got four lighting. Ultimately, when you look at this image, you're going to be looking at the subject. You're not going to be looking at the bright colors in the background unless you're on acid. So let's go ahead and see what it looks like um, at a higher f-stop. And there we go, the higher f-stop. First thing I look at over here is like, what is that, a mail truck or something on the side? And Might you can be a read, bread truck. Yeah, you read farmer's market and all this stuff, and you're like, oh, there's, there happens, there just happens to be someone standing there. Well, that looks just way more pro. And so that's a lower f-stop, higher f-stop. Flipping back and forth between these two, man, is messing me up. Because it's like, where is he? What's going on? But in this case here, you see what's going, you see where the person is, you see what's happening, and you have a, it changes the dynamic of the image. Speaking of changing the dynamic, Let's look at a different subject. Here we have some tomatoes, right? This would be a really great shot for an ad for a grocery store. Now this is like a medium aperture, right? Let's go ahead and make the aperture, uh, let's just open up the f-stop, really low number, like f1.4, and there you go. Now the subject is that one little thing of box of whatever the freaking, those little tomatoes, foreground's out of focus, background is beautiful and blurry, it's all your focus is right there. And this is a very, open aperture. Here's just some other examples, just showing like how shallow it is when you're, you know, shooting things that are close. That's how blurry you can make the background at low f-stops. This image is barely usable. Just a tiny bit of that meat is in focus. The rest of it's just a mystery. Happens to be a boar, but you would never know it. Look at that. Mmm. Do you want to put that in your mouth? No. What are you being crabby for? With this camera, we can easily see all the different moving parts and see how the shutter works. So right now we're going to show you guys what a really slow shutter looks like. As you can see there, when you hit the shutter button, it goes by. It's open for a long time. So your film or your sensor is being exposed to light for a long period of time, has a lot of time to soak it up. So when you kick the shutter up a little bit, you may miss it. So you might find one or two frames in this because we're only shooting this at what, 24 frames a second? So we shot it just at the right speed where you should just barely glimpse it and it's gone. Yeah, it's so fast. So that that's a fast shutter, shutter speed which is what you'll probably be using if it's you know bright and sunny outside. You don't want your image to be overexposed or just blown out. So it's a super fast shutter speed, just, and it's, it's over, that's it. And that's how the uh, shutter works. Now let's talk about what it does. Now there's Kane hanging out, and that's a decently fast shutter speed, fast enough to stop him. I was shaking my head in for this photo, and we were just trying to show that this was high enough shutter speed that it stopped my face from becoming a giant blur, like this So one. when we slow it down, there we go, his head's moving back and forth. It's not fast enough to stop his motion. That One four hundredth of a second uh, should generally stop human motion. So if somebody's running, it'll stop them mid-stride and you'll be able to capture that image. If they're like, you know, the flash, you're not gonna catch them at all because they can move faster than the speed of light. Yeah, now this, this camera I believe goes up to 1 4,000th or maybe even 1 8,000th of a second. 1 4,000th. 1 4,000th of a second. And that's really what you're gonna need. 1 2,000th, 1 4,000th, somewhere in that range, anywhere between that. That will stop a hummingbird with its ridiculous speed flapping. Uh, that'll stop that. That'll stop like a cheetah, a snake strike. Um, if you wanted airplane, to get, uh, yeah, an airplane race car. Or, uh, if you wanted to capture a yeah race car, water. Yeah, water droplets and all that sort of thing. Sometimes it's interesting to allow the shutter to stay open for a while when you see water. If you've ever seen one of those shots where the water looks like silk, they've left the shutter open for a long time, and then you you know, produce this really interesting effect where all the motion that's happening while the shutter's open is just turning into a blur. So it looks like silk. That's how they've done that. So if you want to stop like a waterfall, shoot it fast. If you want it to look like a, a silky, almost misty type thing, you can leave the shutter open for a while. Your hands, they shake a little bit. They move a little bit. That can also create blur. 
So this is me shooting, just moving my hands around at a very low shutter speed. Just I was like, you know, just moving the moving the camera around a little bit. So as you can see there, those subjects are stationary, but my hand is making the blur. There again, I just like moved the camera way too much while the shutter was open. Again, that's, you, people see this all the time. Like you, you go to a birthday party, it's dark inside, you take a bunch of pictures and you get back and they all look like this. Happens all the time. People are just like, why man, why? Well, it's because your shutter speed was too slow because it was trying to compensate for the lack of light. Best practice for shutter speed, it really has to do with the combination of the other two elements in this. Your aperture, your ISO, and then it's, what are you trying to take a picture of? So if you're trying to take a picture of like the pomegranates, you need a higher shutter speed just enough to stop your handshake from causing yeah, the motion blur. Uh, and then you need your aperture set probably wide open or relatively wide open to allow more light in. And then your ISO is gonna be set at a level that allows the least amount of film grain or the least amount of noise. Digital noise, yeah. But yet still have a nice clear image. So all these things really work together and a lot of it's going to be up to you as far as what sort of image you wanna take. And there's a, you, have, you have a lot of power once you learn, learn these three things. Now, some people are gonna be overwhelmed and be like, oh man, I have to figure out every time I do a shot what I want the ISO and the shutter and the, all the aperture, what the hell, man, F-stop, what the hell is that? Almost all modern cameras, they have a dial. The dial has M for manual mode, which is how we shot most of these pictures, just put it on manual mode. But there's also a few other things that you should be familiar with, namely A and S. Sometimes it's S, sometimes it's TV for time value. The Canon cameras usually have TV and AV for aperture value and time value. The Nikon here has A and S for aperture and shutter. Yeah. Aperture value, you set it there, you adjust your ISO to where you want, and then you can set your aperture to wherever you want. So in this case, you want a really shallow depth of field. You set it for 1.4, 2.0, really shallow. You can snap the photo, and it automatically calculates what the shutter speed's gonna be. It makes it so easy, it's ridiculous. You don't have to worry about anything. It will correctly expose the picture based upon your criteria. Now, if you set it on um, S for the Nikon or TV for time value on the Canons, now that's uh, going to do the exact same thing, but for shutter. You say like, hey, my son's playing soccer or I wanna you know, get a picture of this bird flying around. So I'm gonna put it on shutter value and set the shutter for something really fast, like 1 400th, 1 500th of a second, really fast shutter and then the camera will calculate the aperture and everything else. So that's how you can use the shutter. And also it's good if you wanna like, I wanna get like a nice blurry fluid motion or you wanna get some blur, you can set the shutter very low and then the camera will figure everything else out. So modern cameras make it really easy. On these old cameras, you just have two settings and you do it all yourself and that's it. So I hope uh, this information has helped you, uh, will help you in developing your photography skills. Uh, go out there, use your camera test some stuff out and never be afraid to just take a photo. Especially if you're using digital, just fill up your memory card with stuff. If it doesn't look good, test it, experiment, change what you're doing. Yeah, you gotta Try get there something around, man, yeah. So this is the Nikon uh, you know, D750 that we used in this test and we grabbed this off of MassDrop and this camera's gonna be on there quite frequently. So you'll see that, you'll see a few different lenses. We've got the 50 millimeter 1.4 lens, which I freaking love. Uh, it, it's almost, too good as far as like just beautiful background blur. Sometimes it's difficult to stay in focus. It's just so ridiculous. You can stop it up a little bit. But anyway, so go over and check out their photography community. And, and again, say thanks to them for uh, providing this for us to go out and play with. It's much better to play with a full frame sensor than it would be to play with like our Panasonic that's got a, a little crop sensor. That, I don't consider that to be a photography camera. This is a photography camera. I agree. So there it is. <laughs> that's a freaking photography camera as well. Uh, but for certain people. Anyway, we do have a photography section on our community, and we're gonna be doing more photography tutorials and getting quite a bit nerdier than this. We tried to just, like I said, keep this one kind of light as an introduction, but we're gonna get scientific on some of these. So let us know what you wanna see as far as uh, you know, camera and photography tutorials, and we'll see what we can do. Yeah, guys, just keep taking photos uh, and come and post them on the forum. We've got a photography section there, and uh, we can open up and critique and say, hey, this is good, that's bad. Or if you have a question of how can I make it look like this, I've got a photo that I've got, we can talk to you about how, how to make that happen. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much it. See you guys in the forum.